ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Rise Urban Nation. I got, when I say this one is my brother, this is really, 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 really my brother <laughs> in the house. Um, so I'm glad to have him on. It's Mr. Jordan Jerome Harrison. <laughs> I've been, been doing Jerome in there for, for, for those who don't know. <laughs> yeah, let him know. Let him know. Let, let him know. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on, Mr. Harrison? Man, nothing much, Mr. Terrell Simmons. You're right, man. This is my brother from another mother with from the same spot. It's I'm good. I'm good. I know, I know, man. Like it, you know, I I love when I get, you know, the homies homies on to talk because it is they get a, a sneak peek and you know our lives, how we got into our careers and so forth. You know what? I, I I, I, I'm trying to think. Uh, wh- how did we first meet? Because now that kind of escapes me. How did we first? You know, meet? I have no idea. I think when I was uh, when we were all in that building where Workforce Partnership was, I just remember you had that white car, yeah. and I used to just wave at you or just say, well, I, "I saw you in passing." And I just remember, I was just like, "This is a joyous <laughs> black man right here. Like this man's about his business <laughs> and always got a smile on, chin to chin." So I was just, I don't know, and then. I don't even know. I know. I feel like we also had you come speak to the students of Reality Changers a few times uh, during our yeah, career. You, you tabled or something as well. So I, I feel like we were always in similar circles. And then eventually the world, uh-huh. the universe just kept bringing us closer and closer together. Yeah, then we just started. Uh, uh, and then, uh, I remember the last time we worked together. Was it uh, at yep. Mesa College? Mesa College. We did the um, Moga yep. Thing that we put together, yeah. I think that was the last time. Man, we got to fix that. That was like, what? When was that? that was that right before the yeah, pandemic? Yeah, that was pre-pandemic. Because right? no. we was in a room without masks and everything. <laughs> yeah. Man, so we, we overdue for like, because uh, I, I feel like every year we did something. We did that. Yeah. The year before that, we did the, um, when, when Brother Eric was out here, the when we got all the oh, music yeah, together. American Achievement that. Summit. Yeah, African American Achievement yeah. Summit. I, I feel I feel like every year we was doing something oh, together, yeah. whether we planned it ourselves or some two people uh, outside entity brought us yep. into the same <laughs> yep. place. We overdo that. Yeah. So that we'll, we'll make this be the the inaugural yep. one and make sure that we stay on track for twenty twenty two. We're gonna do something for sure. For sure. Yeah, twenty twenty two we make it do what you yes, do. Sir. That's my that's my new thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, you know, let's 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 dive right in. Like, yeah. um, your your career, man. You know, it's been a hell of a journey from you know reality changers to Mister Harvard yeah. to you know everything else you do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's let's start at the beginning. Like, you know, going into your 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 college career, I'm talking about bachelors. Um, how did you how did you buckle down and and and, and figure out what you wanted to do, like for your major to to you know finally get into your career, like because I, I I feel like when I was at the the colleges and I always speak to students, you know they always had this enormous pressure to pick their major, and half of them didn't even know you know what type of career they wanted to get into, uh, or the ones that did know didn't know the route route to go. So like, how did you how did you begin your journey? Like start let's start in there. Yeah, yeah. So uh started, you know, at San Diego State. And uh I was actually bitter the first two years because I got into USC, which was my dream school, but didn't get enough uh money to attend. So I spent the first two years at San Diego State mad at God, mad at the world, like why am I at this school? I didn't want to go to San Diego State. <laughs> and uh, I was still working at Foot Locker part time because my parents was like, if you want a cell phone, you got to pay for that yourself. So I was, you know, one of the late bloomers to the cell phone game. But that was all cool. But, I think, <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I think there it took me a while to, to explore for myself. What is it that I really wanted in a major? Because I think society will tell you, like, it's the lawyers, it's the doctors, all these type of things. So I actually came in as a business marketing uh political science, psychology. So I was a double major and a minor because I've was i always been wanting to be like, yeah. let me get as much as I can get and then go from there. And then I took a practice LSAT at UCSD my second year and I was like, yeah, that's not for me. Uh, and I just loved business. <laughs> I think one thing that I was always fascinated with was human behavior. What motivates people? What moves people? And how do you kind of bring people together for a cause, a movement, or just to see human behavior? So I think... I ended with the marketing 
and psychology and, and a major in marketing and a minor in social and personality psychology. And I loved it. The classes were great. I think they spoke to my mm. strengths in like sales, people, strategic thinking. Those were kind of foundational for me developing it. But it took a while, I think, for me to kind of settle in there and to figure out what that meant. But then my career didn't even go there. So that was that was interesting. No, I, and I was gonna ask you, like, what does one do with those degrees? Like, <laughs> like typically, we put those. In I was all set up in sales, so when I graduated from San Diego State, I actually had twenty four job offers in the corporate world. So I was set to go in into marketing and sales, and or some type of like mm-hmm. young professionals rotational leadership program at a variety of companies. Yeah. That just didn't happen. Okay. So what 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 did happen? Tell people what did happen. So, so, uh, so I, I, there's, there's a lot of things that happened, but I, so here's what happened. So I, I turned it down because it was it was a lot of companies. To, I'm telling you, people was throwing. You know, I'm 21 years old, six plus figures, company car, expense account, all these type of things. Because I had done it, but but I think what grounded me was I did an internship with 3M Company, phenomenal company, Fortune 100. You know, they do great stuff. Um. And I was living a life as a junior in college in summer. I had a company car. I was traveling in a hotel. I was flying. Like At the end of my summer internship, I was like platinum status across every loyalty program for traveling. I loved it. But one moment happened in that <laughs> challenged the notion of what I really want to do with my life. And you know, my bank account was nice. Could do whatever I wanted to do. Job was cool. Wasn't really purpose, but it was like, cool, I'm, 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 I'm in here. And I remember I woke up. I had like this nice... Uh, hotel room two blocks from the White House and I was doing some work in D.C. And I remember waking up being like, dang, this sucks. Like traveling, selling this stuff. What I was doing, I just was like, I don't know if I could commit my life to this. Um, And I remember that was like a moment of reckoning for me where I was just like, I have a skill set that can be applied in this area, but is this the area that I want to like put a lot of time and energy in? Um, Because I felt like the path was too linear. You know, I think I've always had this hustler mentality where I'd rather struggle or have my own But everyone else was like, oh, I could see you as a a VP or C-level. You just put in your time and all these type of things. And I was like, that's cool, but that feels kind of limiting in some way. So when I graduated, I kind of, I still was considering it because also the paychecks were very nice and you can't be mad at a brother trying to make money. So I was just like, "Hmm, this was cool. So it was between, I had a job at uh, the final three were Amazon, Salesforce, and Nielsen Market Research Company and 3M. So it was my top four that I was deciding between. And, uh... This guy from Reality Changer, the CEO at the time, reached out to me and randomly emailed me the spring and was like, hey, can you come and speak to these students? And I was like, yeah, sure. And I loved it. Started working part time. And then when I graduated, he was like, hey, look, I'm not going to be able to offer you nearly as much money, but I want you to think if you'll make half as much impact as you would working directly with these first generation students here in San Diego. And it just that line got me. Just trick me out of everything, mm-hmm. man. At that moment, I just was like, <laughs> I guess I'm not going corporate. <laughs> and I went nonprofit. But it was an interesting, transformative moment in my life because it was a moment that I think I leaned into what I felt was my purpose or how I really wanted to use my gifts and talents and, and build from yeah. there. My paycheck, like my first paycheck was was not even four figures. I remember my first paycheck was $972. And I looked at this and I was like, this for two weeks of work? with the bachelor's degree i was like what is this nonprofit mess i was like what i was just like i made a mistake i was just like i don't know if i want to be i don't want to do this anymore i just was like but then it brought me back to the students in the community and and uh and so i think that was kind of the dilemma in the journey and there were definitely moments where i really wanted to quit but i i uh i loved it but i'll, I'll say this last part i do think what i appreciated though in that moment is you really get to see how hungry you are or how much you'll respond when you're not at a place where you want to be. And I was at a place where I wanted to be in terms of career, professionally, like the type of work I was doing, but I wasn't making the money that I wanted to do. So at that moment, instead of being mad at my job for not paying me enough, I just was like, well, how can I do side hustles or do other things so that I can make extra money? So I wanted to be speaking a lot more, doing consulting a lot more. And that just has just blown up over the past decade. And giving me ample opportunities to grow and speak locally, nationally, and internationally. Yeah, you know, I I love that story because me and you have, uh, you know, a similar story. You know, I remember, um, what what was I doing? Oh, yeah, I was coming out of Ashford University. If anybody who's uh, been been in San Diego know about Ashford University, and and that was my corporate career that, that 
that paid me very well. The checks was handsome. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and I remember uh, being let go from that that job when they had a big uh, um, reshuffle, and I was like, "Man, what am I going to do?" Like, and and in the it was a blessing in disguise because you know when I was looking at the corporate structure and lifestyle I was I was heading and and the trajectory like you were saying it wasn't fulfilling right and then also mm-hmm. there was a lot of things that didn't align with my values that I, I had to do to stay you know persist in that career and move up the corporate ladder and I was like you know I don't know I don't know if this was me so it was a blessing in disguise but then after that you know that, that soul searching came I was like all right what am I going to do I need something that's meaningful and then nonprofit. Uh, my mentor was like, nah, I was like, man, you, you pay me, not nah, probably I'll leave, make you money then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I heard the exact same thing. Some of my business mentors at the time, that was all that I had, they were like, yo, you do nonprofit after you get successful. Like, go get your corporate job, do that on the weekends or after your nine to five, but do be right. successful in corporate world first. And I was like, I hear that. And I think I'm not going to knock it. I understand it, but it's just, I just remember there were so many people. There was one meeting I had with the person who was an, a, a C level person at this Fortune 100 company. And and I talked to him. He had been there for 40 years, you know, prior generation state jobs, this company for like, they were just lifers. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, man, like, like, were you happy? Like, are you cool? He's just like, I mean, I kind of got this job and it's been paying the bills. So I just kind of grown with it. And I felt like I just heard too many narratives of folks where life was like a happenstance. This was a cool job. I just mm-hmm. rock with it. And they took care of me. But there was this, and, and, and you know, it's cool. You got the house, you got the picket fence, you got, all, and it's cool. There's, there's, not, there's no knock to it, but there was another level of intentionality that I felt like I was reckoning with of just like, yo, time is precious. And if I am spending mm-hmm. my time selling a product that I don't really believe in or in an organization that's not really like fulfilling to my soul or at least speaking to it in some manner, then I really need to reevaluate. And it's just so interesting how many people I talked to where it just felt like life happened to them mm-hmm. and they're grateful, they got comfort. But I'm like, what was the cost of like, you being intentional with your time or thinking like, what is it that I'm, and, and it's not that you don't get that in corporate, like you can do that and volunteer or be part of corporate. There's a lot of ways you can do it. But the people that I was speaking, I was speaking to, they were just like, it paid the bills. I traveled. It was cool. And now I'm going to retire. I was like, yeah. you know what I find too? I think um, our parents' generation was more that generation that was like, okay, you know, I'm going to grind it out. And I'm going to just do this mm-hmm. and so I can have a living yep. and, and, and yep. it, you know, I'll, I'll fulfill my purpose when I retire. Yep. Right. Yep. They, they was that, that was their mentality. I think this new generation is a little different. Um, and, and they're more in about intention. I like, Oh, you know, my, t- I seen what my parents would do. <laughs> that ain't for me. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I want something. Yep. <laughs> Impact purpose. I don't care. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it was, I, I saw that generational class where, where I did my internship because the people at 3M, which I love the company, respect them. They do a lot of great work. They they were there like, yes, like you'll have job security. Like we've been here, like people have been there like 50 years. They get like a nicer parking spot. I remember us as interns, we're like, wait, so I stay here 50 years and I get like a nicer parking spot? Like that's what the pay, like I know you get more money, but I just remember there was like this, like we were all thinking 50 years at one place. Like it's just interesting how we define loyalty, flexibility now compared to, because I get it, like stability and the generational yeah. differences, the environmental differences, the historical differences. So it's a it's an interesting time. Yeah. Hey, you know, and to that point, like I love the testament of, you know, when you, like going back to the early part of your story, it was like, uh, you know, uh, they were really focused on that money and, and that stability. And I think this new generation is looking for something different. And, and I tell, I, I challenge people like, what if you can have both? Because, you know, with me and your journey, it's yeah. like, look, I, I, I went for my passion and my purpose and my dreams and, and I got both out of it. I, I like, yep. that's when I started getting the phone calls. Hey, somebody told me that it, I don't even really advertise my, my speaking services and yeah. consulting services like that. Like it's just yeah. referral. Like, yeah. like, Hey, somebody told me that you can, you, you, you can do the, this workshop. Somebody told me that you're the person to go to for this. Like you, we said before I hit the record button. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then I said, yeah, yeah, I, I can help you. And I was like, all right, how much would it cost for you to come out and do this? And then, you know, and, and you know, I had to get more confident in, in, you know, my pricing. And then once I raised my price and people was like, oh, that's it. I was like, oh, dang, I can still keep yep. going up. Yep. Like, I, 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 I guess, I guess, I guess the, the streets is really amping me up here. <laughs> true, I feel like you were all, you and I were on like similar paths. I feel like we had conversations before about like, yo, how much are you charging? How much am I charging? Like, just try to make sense of those yeah. things. And we were just like, what are we supposed to do with this? But, but I also don't want to belittle the point of like, 
the excellence and like the stewardship of the gifts and talents that we had to be called upon as subject matter experts or people that can assist in areas, you know, because I feel like a lot of folks, some or some folks I know, you know, you want the glamour of the outcome of the hard work, but sometimes they're hesitant to put in the hard work to become excellent. And I think when it comes to serving folks, yeah. creating a business, all those type of things, really being excellent about your craft, how you can service people, the follow up, the follow through, all those type of things, because to me, it like having that successful side hustles, the consulting, the speaking gigs, part mm-hmm. of the, it's, it's selling, you know, but it's also relationship building and it's the follow-up and it's all those other things too. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, you have to be excellent in, in all those ways, especially when talking about like ourselves, where we have businesses that are very like, I mean, like you said, we're not pushing super marketing or anything like that. Like come hear me speak. Yeah. Like I'm, I barely post on social media, but being able to still build with folks. So I think it's, 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 it's powerful. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm getting a little bit better at social media, but I got I got some people helping me out with that, and, and that's mostly to push the podcast. No, I want I want people like the people I've met along the way to shine. Yeah, um, yeah. which which in turn, you know, when 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 you rise, we rise. Uh, oh, look, look, I even got the hat. Let me hold on. Let me let me show you. When 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 I rise, you rise. We rise together I rise, you so. rise. Yeah. <laughs> that's it yeah that's it so, so that, that that's what it's all about to me is you know making sure like because you know if look if me and my whole squad like me you uh uh eric uh who i just interviewed uh last week nice. by the way uh and and the whole squad if we all successful and we all doing great things in our different perspectives uh, nobody will fall because we all be each other's crutches when we can support each other once, you know, as we start the, the build. We can't, if, if we all, if, if only one of us makes it and the rest of us is struggling, it's hard for us to, to, to make the changes in the community that we want to see, right? Absolutely. But if we all successful, we, oh man, we a powerhouse yeah. then. And that's, right? and that's my mentality. Like, that's why I think that's why we have the group of folks that we have, like the think tanks, the brother, the, the, the community and accountability that we have, because it's like, although we are all in our separate lanes, we also will hold each other accountable, pull each other up and make sure that we're all, you know, doing X. Cause I, I think to your point, if, if I'm successful, whatever, however I define success, however we define success, but like you or anyone else is not successful, then to me, we are successful. Like I'm not successful because I think I want to be successful. I also need my community to be successful. And so what does that what does that look like and how do we really lift each other up? Because I think you said we can all rise together, but having that accountability and care for each other has to be integral to that. Right. Now, now um, here's one question I want to ask you because I always ask this to my guests, uh, especially for, you know, any young folks that's listening, whether they're in college and so forth. Because uh, I, I like to let, because sometimes some young folks, I'm not saying all, they like to, like, as soon as they come out of college, uh, the first job out the gate. Or maybe they have this expectation of, like, I'm going to get this amazing job because I, <laughs> I, I, I studied hard. I, I deserve this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then sometimes they don't understand. <laughs> you, you know, First job ain't always gonna be what you think it is, mm-hmm. but this thing mm-hmm. you can learn to, to help you grow the second job. So, what was your first? I, I know you. I, I heard Foot Locker so in there, but what was your first first job? <laughs> it was it was Foot Locker. It was foot, well. I mean, I was also slanging candy in, in, in middle school and in high school as well. To cut it, so I was like, look, it was still an entrepreneur. I was still doing first it, was still job. Doing it. Foot Locker was the official <laughs> first job, man. And I was I was fifteen and a half, just got my work. I, I'm telling you, man, I've always been on that hustler mindset because my mentality was. I might not be the smartest person in the room, but I will outwork anyone. And that's how I've just kind of viewed how I can just come at things. I'm just like, you might be smarter than me, but I'm going to stay up five more hours and be able to be able to, like, it might take longer, but I'm going to get there. Um, But it was at Foot Locker. Um, I was there for five and a half years from 2008 to 2012 or 2013, I think. Uh, and I, I your sneaker game is fresh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I, even there though, I was I, by the time I left, I was an assistant manager. I was on my way. But I'll tell you this though, I, I think to the point of like the importance of mentorship or having role models, how important that is. My first manager, it was me and my homie. It was another black man named Joshua Beverly. Um, we both started there at the same time, both fifteen and a half, exact same grade. Kind of went through the ranks together. Um, 
our manager mm -hmm. saw in both of us. He was like, y'all are going to do a lot more than Foot Locker. So he always made sure he's like, yo, if y'all got a test, don't come into work. Just tell me. I don't care if it's on the day of. Like he was, when we, when he, when we were there, he demanded excellence, but he always said like, y'all will not be lifers in Foot Locker. And like, y'all are, I, I'm going to keep pushing you all. And like the crazy part about it is, is now he's actually a, a doctor uh, at UCLA. He went through the whole process, started at Foot Locker, and now I'm getting my doctorate degree. So two young brothers started at Foot Locker, 15 and a half, had like intentional relationships and mentorships with folks. And now both of us are on our way to being doctors in, in like almost 20 yes. years later. So, I love that. I love that. Yeah. You know who else started at Foot Locker too that I did know or had a job at Foot Locker? <laughs> Ronald <laughs> Preston Clark. <laughs> Foot Locker is a come up for the community, man. <laughs> I know, like, I know, like you know, I, this just like this Foot Locker journey sounds familiar too. Like who else? And I just remember when I interviewed Ronald, he told me he was working at the Foot Locker too. Like he got, he got, he, I don't know how he got hooked up with it, but he got, somehow got hooked up with a job at Foot Locker, and that was one of his, his yeah, early man. gigs. <laughs> that was my first job. I loved it. I, I loved it. I loved it. I mean, it just taught discipline, taught all these things, taught sacrifice, all these. I mean, and retail sales. And you got good mentorship from it, um, so uh, I love that. So let, let, let's talk. Let's fast forward real quick because you, you you gave me a sneak preview into the PhD. But before I get to the PhD, let me tell you guys: this man was knee deep in his career. I think it was at Reality Changes yeah. at the time, yeah. and yeah. yeah, he makes the announcement like LeBron's going to South Beach. <laughs> I'm going to Harvard. How did that? How did that come about? How did listen. Like, <laughs> I, I, listen, I, I, that, the grace of God, I don't even know. Um, so I had a colleague at Reality Changers who went there for her master's. And she told me, she was like, oh, you should apply for Harvard. By this time, I was like, I went to San Diego State, work at a small local nonprofit. Like Harvard's for a different type of folks. Like that ain't me. But she kept annoying me about it. It took me two years to apply. And I was, I was at a place in my career, too. I was also like, you know, my undergrad was in business marketing. I'm doing more of this education stuff. I felt like I needed more theoretical grounding to better understand education and systems and how to how to like do it better. And so I was like, I looked around and I'm telling you, I put all my eggs in one basket. I only applied to Harvard. I was just all or nothing. Either we get in or we don't. And eventually she, I mean, her pay, it paid off. I got that acceptance email. But, but not only that though, not only did I get an acceptance email, also got a full ride that covered my entire tuition. I was one of seven students to get an Urban Scholars Fellowship that gave me an entire full ride to Harvard um, out of 750 students wow. that were attending there. And, and you know, but, but to me, I think it just really goes back to, to following what you feel, A, pays the bills. Because I think sometimes it's, it's also a privilege to say you can follow your purpose and to have the means to be able to do that because I also get the realities of life. But if there are ways that you can be aligned with the things that mo that that allow you to come the most alive, it will make room for you in spaces where if you would have told me if I left San Diego State, gave up the corporate world and would earn a full ride to Harvard for a master's in education, I would have laughed at you. I'd have been like, yeah, that's not going to happen. But to see that happen, it's yeah. completely, completely blew my mind, completely is unprecedented. And it has opened up crazy doors for local work, national work, international work, and being able to come back to the community and to say, yo, Harvard's accessible. Like, let's bring Harvard to the hood and also bring the hood back to Harvard because Harvard needs it more than, than it knows. So, yeah, man. Oh, I love, I love that. We got to turn that to a t-shirt. Bring Harvard <laughs> to the hood and bring yeah. the hood back to Harvard. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a bar right there. <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was transformative, man. It, it was, it was, it was transformative. And I think, I also noticed how important networks and resources are, but also the differences of them. Like yeah. what I had access to at San Diego State, who I was learning from, who I was learning with. It was dope and it was cool and it was grateful. But like, obviously it's, it's Harvard and people want to go there for a reason. But I really realized like the networking, the opportunities, who you're learning from. I remember I was in a meeting one time with a friend and we were talking about trying to work with this other organization. And I was like, oh yeah, I think I know someone who's like the manager over there. He was like, hey, we're, we're at Harvard now. Like, we just talked to the CEOs. I was just like, oh, my bad. Like, I, 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 <laughs> I, was, like, I was like, all right. That's a whole different mindset right there. That's yeah. a whole different mindset. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was just like what you have access to, who you have access to, who you're in relationship with, uh, just helps you get things done quicker, who you can talk to and stuff like that. So I was just like, oh, learn that very quickly. And, and, Yo, and that, 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 that is a complete mind shift right there. Like, yeah. 
we at Harvard now. We only talk to CEOs. Yeah, yeah. Because because it's it's, I, my, you know, it's it's that mindset shift of of saying that, but then also having access to it. You know, where it's just like, yeah, and you could just call right. someone and you're just good. You're from Harvard. You're good. So it's just it, it's crazy. Right, right. And and I think you know, staying on that mindset shift is the most important thing that we need in our community and, and just for ourselves. And sometimes it takes some work, continuous work to to do that. Uh, like, you know, for me, uh, another mindset that's along the same status fair as what, what you, you received there at, at Harvard was, you know, doing this podcast and then having, you know, conversations with CEOs and, 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 and VCs and funders and, and then saying, hey, you know, when they come out, I was like, ah, oh, we heard what you, you, you're doing over there. We like what you're doing. We want to be connected to some of the, you know, the, the, the young young black professionals that you got going on as building stuff. How can we how can we connect? Like 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 do you have a connection to this, 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 this? It's like, yeah, you know, I may, I may I was like, all right, well, if you can get us in touch with the CEO, right? And I was like, I was like, dang, we CEO status. Like uh, and it's like, I I'm I'm gonna pay these funders, bankers, CEOs yeah. <laughs> and, and get that crew together now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, dang. All right, and then even even the company called me. I was like, "Hey, could you um, how much would it would you charge to you know to to coach you know our, our CEOs and our VPs on, on on some equity, diversity, and inclusion issues?" I was like, "Dang, I'm coaching, I'm coaching execs now." <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, and that was a mindset yep. shift, right? Because you're like, "All right, well, yeah. I gotta I gotta make sure I'm hanging. I don't gotta step my game up." <laughs> yep, yep, and I think that was something for me too. Just also, you know, I feel like for so long, you'll be at a place or you might be at a place where it's like, I'm hoping for a seat at the table. And then sometimes you might come to the table and be like, oh, shoot, whether it's imposter syndrome or just like, but then being able to to get there to be like, nah, like I'm in here. Like we, we are in this together, like that mindset shift and becoming that and belonging in that and 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 uh, owning it. It, it took a moment for me to grow into it. Sometimes right. I still am like struggling with that because sometimes I get on some boards or committees and I'm looking, I'm looking around the table and I'm just like, who did I trick to get into this meeting or how did I, how did I get up here? But then I'm also like, I'm not going to yeah. squander this moment. Like I'm, I'm going to be prepared for this moment. I'll make sure that we're going to be excellent and make things happen. But I think even that mindset shift of belonging and where do we see ourselves belonging mm-hmm. to, where do we see ourselves being responsible for and, and those type of things and, and not getting to spaces even if they might not be made for you to say, how will I let them know that I belong here? And I'm a rock with y'all and y'all going to see like, we we're in this together, you know? Yeah. You know, no, um, I, I, I feel you wholeheartedly on that. Cause like, you know, I still struggle with that too at times. And then, you know, there's sometimes I'm sitting at the, at these tables and, you know, there's very few people that look like me at these tables. And then when we go into yep. conversations and I was like, I was like, Oh, Oh, and I'm thinking to myself in my head, I don't say it out loud. I was like, oh man, I need more people like me at this table because this, this, <laughs> there's nobody else. Seeing me. Like what I'm seeing, like, uh, I guess I'm the only one seeing this or nobody's yeah. speaking up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 But I was like, or am I seeing it wrong? Like, uh, this, this, I see three things right there that should be corrected, right? <laughs> yep. yep. And then yep. I was like, all right confirmation that you know either i'm supposed to be at this table or i got something to learn from this table (laughs) yeah yeah but i think i think you bring up a a great point too because i think both of us especially like the dei space and building belonging institutions and spaces there's a lot of truth that has to be shared and how do you best introduce that truth so that it's received so that it's pushing forward while also being aware of all the dynamics that are at place. But I think when you think about like my work, I think collectively our work, it's really in the business of truth telling for the sake of like progress, shared humanity, and how do we go there? And and I think our work is really situated in the ignorance that some folks in society systemically gives folks. And so how do we help folks move the blinders, understand the truth, engage with the truth, and then start making meaning of how they move forward with it. And it's it's a challenging balance uh, to really move situations and individuals forward. Yeah. And, and hold space for yourself, too, because Absolutely. I think, you know, sometimes when, when we're in this work, we, we 
you you could get so um in the trenches of it that if you don't make time for self you can lose self uh or or a piece of self in it right um yeah. and, and yeah. then you have to come be able to come back out and and analyze you know uh you know what is true for me and how am i showing up in this in this situation what what what, what role am i playing in this and in this part and how am i being received you know what is triggering me you know and and and, and naming what's in the room so to speak yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and and being able to name it um and and hold space for each other in that in that space uh, of yeah. what's you know causing the barrier the rift to change or, or whatever is going on in that situation so I, it, it's I, a tough absolutely. balance as you said and and I think you know, I, I think a few things on that. I think to to your first point, um, the mental health conversation that we've had now nationally, internationally, has really brought to to the forefront how we how do we take care of ourselves and think about our own selves. But I, I also think about I can't remember if it's Aristotle or Socrates that said this quote, but it was an unexamined life is not worth living. Um, and I think about a lot of the work that we're doing or that society is at is causing us to examine things now in ways that we have never examined before. Uh, questioning things that maybe we have never questioned before or questioning the normalcy of things that we've never questioned before. And I think one of my mentors told me, um, who done just crazy money, just doing businesses and things like that. He told me one of the things that kind of I stuck with was what people need to get better at is not necessarily trying to get the answer, but how do you get the right question and how do you develop better questions so that we can answer some of the most complex and challenging uh, questions of our time in your time. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the the reality is a lot of folks don't really want to do that hard thinking of what are the questions, what does that require of me, and how, how do I deal with that? And I think about my life has been dealing with addressing personally, intellectually, societally, what are the questions that we need to be questioning? What are the things that we're not questioning? What are the things that we've allowed to be normal? And what is my role within that? Um, but it's a lot easier mm -hmm. to just sit through life and let it happen to you to go through without genuinely questioning some of the things that are necessary for us to be better personally, mm -hmm. uh, collectively, and for humanity as a whole. Yeah. I do think you know a lot of it has to do with the the work, the self work that you do, and I think absolutely yeah. because me and you come from uh, a cloth of always wanting to better ourselves, always wanting yeah. to educate ourselves, always wanting, always seeking knowledge. Right? It, it 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 even though the journey to to do it is still tough, it's it's easier because mm -hmm. we are built from that I, I i need to get better i need i want more knowledge da, da, da. And, yeah. and, the, and the erics and the models of the world right but when somebody yeah. Yeah. gets to the point of like, i'm good right i don't want to i don't want to do that much more much more work on self like i'm i'm comfortable let me be comfortable it, yeah. it, it gets harder to, to to get those folks engaged in and in, in those type of dialogue conversations I, absolutely <laughs> Absolutely. I think that's the number one question when I do consulting for DEI companies, especially large ones. They're like, hey, look, we got this group of folks that are all about it, that love it. There's this folks that'll show up, but they're probably indifferent. And then there's some folks that just are just like, uh, like, do we really need this? I don't really care. Like, how do we bring those folks along? I feel like I, there's every company I've talked to, like, there's a certain population of staff or employees or folks. How do we bring them along? And like, what do we, how do we do all that? And I think it, it really goes to that, that question that you brought up of just, Maybe it's complete, and I don't want to assume what it is for any person, but whatever has shaped their worldview or perspectives or values, and not saying that's good or bad, but there's a little bit more of an indifference towards either the personal work and how that can relate to society as a whole, which, you know. Like, like, you know what? My answer to that is too in a, in a theory. Like, I, I, I think about the times when I was a snotty, ignorant, uh, snotty nose, ignorant kid that grew up in the, the hoods of DC and, and, you yeah. know, my, my world route was very small on that. It's pretty much that block and everything outside of it was not for me because, you know, I've been conditioned to think this way. The yeah. only thing that helped me break out of that cycle was having a mentor who was different from me, who had a lot of grace and patience and persistence. Right. Yep. yep. Yeah. And did engaging in conversation with me, that was really about getting to know me, not trying to change who I was, but understanding who I was. And then yep. I 
then broke down to try to understand who they were because they took so much time to understand me. And then that it opened up a new perspective, like, oh, snap, like, really? And then opened yeah. up new experiences, new foods, yeah. new places. And, and then all and then I started to soak in more culture, which then started to do the paradigm shift to my world. Like, all right, my world expands. So if we could do little things for people that, you know, expand outside their world, whether it's a potluck where they try new food and they meet new people, that small paradigm shift leads to the next one. And, and to the next one, and to the next one, until so they can get to the bigger. So they, so they, they've grown enough to where they're like, you know what? I've actually experienced this, and I, I don't believe that to be true because da da da. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but I think to to those questions and these conversations is what grounded my wondering in undergrad, which is why I was a marketing psychology minor because I just was fascinated with like, how do folks change? How do they learn? How is their behavior modified? Like, I was just fascinated with like grocery stores, where you put the right colors in the shelving units and like where you put some things at eye level for the kids so that they can grab it or where it's like just all those type of small nuanced things yeah. that are indirectly or directing our behavior, whether consciously or unconsciously. And it's just, just like blew my mind. But to your point, I think that's exactly how I think some of that social behavior change where it takes grace, it takes relationships, and it takes not going in to change a person, but just saying, here might be some other information that might be of interest to you when it's appropriate and in a relationship. And how can that then influence them with the right environments and care? You know, people don't want to learn in hostile environments or feel like no one cares. That just causes greater division and, and friction. Is Well, I think, yeah, to your point. So how do you create more, I don't know. I don't like to use safe spaces anymore because safe spaces, I feel like, is a term that, that's overused and it's not always safe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or especially yeah. for people, LGBT, people of color, like even we say a safe space, it's not really a safe space. What it is, it's more of a, a space where, all right, we're not going to offend each other. So if things get too heated, we're going to chop that off, but it doesn't allow for growth and so forth. So there's, the space is still kind of toxic, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But how yeah. do we create more? brave spaces per se where it allows for some civility allows for some conversation so that you know we can have the those type of dialogues that create transformational change i don't know how do you how do you Man, that's, do that? that's a tough one that's, that's a tough one i think i think um, <laughs> i think there's a few spaces in, in which i try and facilitate those spaces but i think i think one of the the hardest things about those spaces created is um as a facilitator, you definitely can create those spaces, you know, having group norms and, and spaces for those for people. But I also think there's individual responsibility for folks to do that self-work to enter, right? And like, if you can enter that work as someone from a disenfranchised community, do you have the capacity to engage with, I don't even want to say like teaching other folks, because that's not, that's not their role, but like engaging in a space where harm can occur or things like that from someone who doesn't understand. Like what's, it, to me, it's almost like, what's the level of grace that people are coming in with to do humanity together, to do life together and not to judge someone right or wrong if they have that capacity, but let's willfully go in there so that we can know not that we're conflict avoidant because I think conflict's great, but let's also engage with it with like, how, what are the principles of care when someone says something that's harmful, when someone says something that's that, that doesn't throw them completely away and says you deserve to just be locked up for forever um, but how do we know that, like, our, our if, if our humanity, as Desmond Tutu says, if our humanity is truly bound together, then what does that mean for our humanity to coexist, knowing that there will be dis difference, knowing that there will be conflict, knowing that we've been sociologically, like, socially... Um, socially brought up different with values and things like that. But how do we how do we kind of come together and who has the capacity to enter those spaces to to see our shared humanity grow? Because I think the farther that we can that we will continue to kind of isolate or say this this space is for these people and only these people. This space is only for these people. We're really going to build potentially a society where folks just go to your go to your corners and just stay there. But the beauty yeah. That can exist is when we find those ways to work through those differences. And I'm not saying that this is simple or like not being oppressive. I'm saying folks have serious work to do, but how do we actually then bring the folks together so that we can at least dream, build, and do together um, while doing 
learning and trying to do better and being committed to being better and being committed to being challenged. Because I also know for myself, there are still some probably values or beliefs or ways that I show up that are not the most transformative. And I am okay with that in the sense of when I am informed about it, I will do what I need to do to do to be better and to address it. And how do we build that? Where it's like, we're not trying to tear down folks. We're not trying to call you or damn anyone to hell. But what we are trying to say is that we have the capacity to be excellent. It will require work from all of us. So let's be committed to the work for our collective shared humanity. Mm, love that. Love that. And, and, and that's why I love, you know, starting, you know, just like you, uh, transformative sessions with, you know, you know, a grounding of rules of how we're going to be in this space with each other together so that we we as a collective we you know we 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 build the rules together right so yeah. this is yeah. this has something to get us started but what else would we like to you know contribute to the space so that we are the best of ourselves in this space we're not shying away from conflict but we're embracing uh you know all of the the different things that show up in this space in a collective human uh collective effort to, you know, move humanity forward, right? Um, yeah. And that's it. And I tell you, with something that we need more in this cancel culture, because I think this cancel culture is going to, like, hinder a lot of that work, right? Because <laughs> yeah. people are going to be and, too scared to say anything or don't want to do anything. <laughs> yeah, and I can't remember. I think it's, oh, where's the book? Uh, there's a book on, like, we will not cancel this or something. Because I think that cancel culture is horrible. Because the reality is, all of us can be canceled for something. Like, go back in our lives. Like, all of us have probably done something that we could say, mm, that probably wasn't the best thing to do. And it's just like, we have to make the space for the human experience, for grace, because the reality is, and, and Eric and I talk about this a lot, what we do on the micro allows for things on the macro, right? So what we do when we could just throw people mm-hmm. out could give us the morality to say, well, this is why prisons need to be able to put people in solitary confinement because if they're horrible and like, what does it really mean to care for each other and to know that like we are all, and obviously there's things that like, I'm not trying to make that an overly simplistic statement, but I think, um, I completely agree with you. I think cancel culture is horrible. I think grace, forgiveness, humanity, experience, human experience, the human experience is, is real and all of us are a work in progress. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, um, I want to get back to, you know, the, because we mentioned Harvard a little bit and, and yeah. PhD, but before I go into the PhD part, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I want to yeah. talk about what is it like being, the, you know, I, 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 I I, I'm, I'm probably sure there's plenty of black men that come out of Harvard, but I don't know too many. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that there's not a there's not a a ton of us coming out of Harvard, but what all. is it like to be one of handful coming out of Harvard? What is that experience like? What's that feeling like? And what does it do for your world? I know we spoke to a little bit of it, but I just I just need to I just need to feel it. Tell me, it, 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 <laughs> it, it, it does so much, man. I, I that is it's, you call it the H card. You drop the H cards, doors open, people to listen, and it's it's like. It's it's crazy the amount of respect or just like oh shoot like this came from Harvard then like oh we're definitely gonna listen like if, it's just it's been ridiculous I think even sometimes I wear it around just walking around San Diego folks are like oh you went to Harvard and it's just like it's like instant celebrity status uh, but it's it's but I think it's also <laughs> a, a a responsibility to stewarding the knowledge and 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 making it accessible to to folks as well but. The, the amount of doors that have been open, the amount of folks that just see the Harvard name and what it's just, it's, it's been ridiculous. Um, and, and in some ways unfair, cause I'm just like, I, my program was nine months and, and education and, and, but just the affiliation has just opened up so many doors. And so it's been crazy. Like just job interviews, folks calling what? folks like, Hey, with the, it's, 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 it's been incredible. And I'll say this, especially as someone that works with young people, to have a vision of a young black man who went to Harvard, like they're like, oh shoot, it's a lot more accessible than I thought. And I think that's one of the things I've been trying to do is like break down the Ivy League. Like, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, it's a place, but like we we are in there, we're coming out of there and we're around you. So like, we need more folks in there. Yeah, absolutely. I love it, love it, love it. All right, so tell me about this PhD program you've oh. been chasing. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's a, it's a, you know, just want to continue on down the road. And it's interesting because my research is really looking at 
Um, one of the things I'm looking at are like, how are these DEI efforts impacting black male belonging on high school campuses and like these learning environments? And so I'm really looking at like, are we really generating spaces of belonging for those that are most disenfranchised? Um, we know what the data says, we know what the qualitative thing says, but we've had this reckoning since George Floyd of us really thinking through and trying to be more intentional. And I'm trying to see, are we actually being that intentional? And is it actually working? And I am loving it. I have a dope, uh, Dr. Makiba Jones is my faculty advisor. I think she's over at RISE San Diego. Um, and uh, I, I I love it. At UC, UC San Diego, I needed to stay in San Diego. So I, I have... I loved it. It's been work. It's been reading, but it's. I think it's necessary to be excellent in the, in the crafts and the work that we do. Yeah. So, so um, I'm having a reckoning as well um, from a different spectrum with it, and you know, I, I'm a, I'm gonna call it my official PhD dissertation without being yes. accepted into a PhD program. <laughs> <laughs> Is uh. I don't know, but I don't know if you remember in the beginning of George Floyd, we had all these companies that's like, uh, we pledged to do this. We pledged to donate that. We pledged to uh, 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 hire 30% more. Like, all those pledges happened, right? Right yeah. right during that period of George Floyd. I don't know about you, but I haven't heard too much <laughs> since, uh-huh. you know, uh-huh. since all those pledges happened. So, you know, um, I'm working with my team to kind of look at, all right, you know, the 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 podcast is called Rise Urban Nation, acronyms run. So we want to do a campaign called Run the Receipts. We want to see what, what's, what's been going on. Like, let me, let, you said it, show us the progress yeah. report. If not, you know what? I've interviewed a dozen black organization, community shakers, and influential people who are all about changing the narrative. Let us connect you to some of those folks to help you do that work because <laughs> you can't yeah. do it alone. <laughs> yeah. I love that. I, I, I really do love that. And whatever I can do to support that, let me know because I think that's account. One of my favorite professors always said, "Accountability is not the enemy," and I think holding institutions accountable is necessary so that we can make sure they're not just statements said to feel good or make sure or make black people come support you because you're like, we we have a Black Lives Matter poster out, so you know we're good. It's just like, uh, let's not be performative here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So in this journey uh, of life, yeah, yeah, yeah. PhDs, degrees, got married, all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, this a lot has happened in the, in the past two years. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. lost a parent, rest in peace. Yeah. yeah uh, sure. What's one good lesson life has taught you? I ain't ready for that question. Oh man. Um, Dang, that's that's a good question, Terrell. That's a good cool. That's a good question. I um I don't know. I think this these last two years have definitely been in some ways extreme highs and incredible lows, and trying to balance it all has been interesting while also progressing and and, and still moving forward. Um, and and it might sound very 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 simple, but I, I think for me it was the simple lesson of we. Uh, I don't want to say it sounds oversimplified, but not losing faith in the things that matter to us and being really convicted to the compassion that you have. Um, one of the things that my father wrote down on the note that I saw was we have to face the conditions and change the conclusions. And I realized as I look back at the lineage of I come, where I come from, my great grandfather was fighting racial segregation in Jackson, Mississippi, running the NAACP. He's in like the civil rights. And there's a moment when he was going to vote and two white men pulled a gun on him and said, yo, you can't vote. You need to go. And he it led to like a national court case where he was actually fighting for voting rights and helped with um, uh, desegregating voting. And I just think, and and, pe- and I heard people, I went to Tougaloo, Mississippi, and I met with folks, and they knew about my great-grandfather, and they told me stories of how this Black man in the Jim Crow era in Mississippi was walking the streets, had a death worn out, but he was convicted to the compassion and the call that he had on his life. 
and and was responsible even in the midst of death threats and all these other things to keep on pursuing those things. And so for me, I think that's just been grounding for me in this space, being convicted to the compassion or whatever your calling is that you have and moving forward in that. And and secondly, I would just say that relationships matter. Um, take care of the folks who take care of you and walk with grace and in, in space for the folks that we're all walking with. And and I think just in, on the company side of business and humanity, um, I, I think, sorry, give me like three now, but the last thing I'm thinking of is there's been this, there's not really a difference between work and life since work is at home, work at home, work is at home and home is at work and all these type of things. And um, I think just having the grace to know that life happens and work is not always a priority. Um, folks dealing with mental health, loss of family, grieving their own selves, just trying to make sense of stuff um, that we need to, to, to make sure that we're caring for one another, not in a way that we don't still need folks to do what they need to do. But So I think all those things, I, I, I'm sorry I don't have a succinct one, but I think all those things have been top no, no, of my mind. That was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, I, I, I never got to and, and engage with your dad and uh, uh, and hearing the stories of, of him and, and then now your 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 grandfather and great and, and you know that whole lineage um you know I just see you know I you know you are who your ancestors prayed for and 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 you continue you know their legacy through you I could just see all, like how you know, all of that is just shining and beaming through you. And, and so I, I feel like I've met them because I've met you. I appreciate um, that. So, appreciate that. I, yeah, I, I appreciate you sharing. And, and just, man, it's just in your bloodline. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know how to man, say it. I didn't, even, <laughs> I didn't even tell you about the other one. My grandfather was a, uh, and it's, and I don't, I don't mean to only talk about the men because women were incredible. And they, they're, I think some were teachers, yeah. some were civil rights activists. Like, I know. My grandmother, Ethel Bender, she done a lot of work in Alabama in civil rights. Uh, and so we need to definitely honor the black women that were responsible for me being here as well, because they were integral, if not foundational to everything that I am. Um, and the last story I'll yeah. share is my grandfather, Jonas Bender. He was part of the Mumford Point Marines. I guess the Marines were the last infantry to be in, uh, integrated. So he was part of the first group of men uh, to join the Marines. And he just always told me stories of the things that he experienced, like, I guess the general or the lieutenant said that he would rather take 2,500 white men to battle than 50,000 black men, uh, that all the black men were sleeping on the floor outside the barracks and had to deal with all those type of things. Um, but he was committed to social justice in his own way, which was fighting for the integration of black folks into, into the Marines and, and going on from there. So he got a congressional gold medal back in 2002. So I think I've come from a lineage of folks that were strong in their faith, strong on social justice, um, and were committed to their families. And so I think those are three things that are foundational to me. And I've also just realized the importance of like, we have to know our history, especially as black folks, um, whether our, whatever our family lineage or take my family stories and add them to your own as a black person that's listening to this, um, because that is part of our collective black story, that this is not just a Jordan family story. This is part of the black narrative of what um, our ancestors did, of what our families are currently doing and what's in all of us and our responsibility to continue on the work in whatever way that we see fit. Yeah. And I take that even one step further, which is another reason why I started this podcast, because, you know, my my stepfather is from African descent. He's a Nigerian man and um, he's very familiar with, you know, and something in African culture. They're very grounded in their in their history, their roots and, and so forth. Right. Yeah. And and I think for us as, you know, Americans that are born in the U.S., Black Americans, our, our history goes far back as yep. to, you know, slave days or slavery. Yep. And a lot of us don't go back to like, all right, well, what became before that, if we can yep. trace it somehow or connect yep. to it in a different way, right? Yeah. And when you, when you start to do that, you start to realize, oh, shoot, we was kings. Oh, shoot, we was queens. Oh, shoot, we was... We was rulers, like, <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, and, and yeah. there's, there's some strength in knowing that. There's some power in knowing that, right? Um, uh, when you, you start to see yourself differently, and then when you, then you start to read more about your history, you re realize that the history that you were fed and told was not completely accurate. There was there's some inaccuracies in, in the, the, the U.S. version of our history when it comes to Black people in America. <laughs> Uh, yep. and then yep. you know, yep. the old yep. saying the truth will set you free 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The, that's so, it. And I feel like that's the it. truth is set us free in many different ways because uh, uh, a lot of us are locked in mental slavery due to the narratives that we've been yep. fed to our, about ourselves. And so we need to free ourselves yep. from that mental slavery and that bondage that we're in so that we can unlearn some of the things that we've been conditioned into and, and yep. relearn what life could be. Yep. Yes, sir. Absolutely. So, um, let's go through the steps of, of you getting into your career, starting your, your side hustle, your business, and so forth. Because uh, you know, I yeah. like tangible steps to give people. So what, what would you say were some of the steps you kind of took? You know, I, I know it wasn't linear. You, you kind of went this way. But what, what would you say some of the key steps that really helped you advance along in, in your not only just to you know, move up in your career and nonprofit, but public speaking yeah. and so on? So, so I think um, I'll talk about two things. So I think uh, the nonprofit job was very, very linear um, in the sense of go to a nonprofit or go to your place of work, be excellent. Don't, you know, don't slack off, do your job well and, you know, yeah. position yourself well to do what you need to do. The two companies I started on the side um, was a speaking company that I probably started maybe around 23 and then this consulting company that I started about three years ago, kind of on the DEI stuff. And I think for the speaking company, what I realized was there was a lot of people asking me to um, to speak. And they kept asking me to speak and they started asking me to pay. So for me, it was almost opposite. It was like a demand that I was like, oh, shoot, I need a business for this because I was trying to give out my social security number on my W or my uh, W-9s. And I was like, I need an EIN. So, so I think for me, I needed to... Um, figure out what my main message was, figure out what I was going to tell, um, set up my DBA, my bank accounts, all those type of things, and then really start keeping a network. Like I had an Excel Excel workbook of just like the different places I've spoken at, gotten referrals from folks, and just keeping in touch with them, and then staying big on my follow-up. And then a few years ago, I was able to hire an assistant on like a part-time basis to deal with some things to help out with like the back-end stuff. So that was for the speaking business, that was it. And then it's just... Anytime I go on and speak, following up, making sure the speech was excellent and making sure that I understand the context so that it would uh, resonate well with the community and then continually putting myself out there. Because I think speaking is really, um, it's a word of mouth. I mean, it's speaking. So it's word of mouth, but it's also like word of mouth from folks being connected. Um, my consulting mm-hmm. business, I think I think for me, everything starts with you have to be excellent at something or you have to have deep knowledge or at least deep experience in something to add value to someone else. And so about three years ago, um, I've been doing a lot of work similarly to the speaking where people were asking me to do things and I was helping them out with stuff or helping them think through some pressing questions for them. And then I started consulting different like rotary clubs. And then I was like, now I need to really think about like the business for this. And so I built out just like a whole business plan. I developed the whole DBA and everything as well. And then I was like, okay, let me be strategic about who my target audience is, who is it that I'm really trying to reach, and then going after them. So I was sending cold emails. I was reaching out to folks. Um, and then George Floyd happened, and I didn't reach out to anyone because everyone was just crazy, 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 crazy business and it's kind of been maintained since. And so I think it's being excellent, getting your DBA and figuring out what your business plan is going to be and then pursuing customers, however however that makes sense for your business model. For me, it's really been word of mouth where I haven't really had to market much, but a lot of people have been just yeah. being referred to me. Yeah, same, same, same. I so love that, love that. Um, what's some advice you would give to someone who would like to start a career in your industry? Like they, they feel like they got the gift of gab. They want to public speak, uh, or, or they, they, they've got really good at the, that one thing they want to do and they want to start consulting. What was some, some advice yeah. you would give? On the public speaking side, it's a very saturated market. Everybody's speaking about everything. So really figuring out what is it that you're speaking about and who do you resonate most with, um, and stay and, and trying to build out that, that space if you need to start. And, and I'd also say, don't pass up free gigs, uh, especially when you don't know who might be in the room. I think I was able to grow my business a lot in the beginning because I did so many free gigs um, just to get myself out there to kind of get people to know about me. And then that's just provided ample opportunity. So I think for me now in my business, I still have about 30% of my speaking gigs a year will be for free, um, particularly for schools, mm-hmm. nonprofits, or companies that uh might not have the means to to afford it. So I'll still be sure to provide access there. But I'll say, uh, know your audience and have that clarity of topic and, and figure out where you want to start 
Um, and then you have to get out there and really network um, or just talk with folks because everyone is interesting. Companies, schools, leadership retreats, everyone's looking for a speaker. Everyone needs a speaker. I'm part of like Rotary and we need a speaker every single week that comes and speaks to our meetings, right? And so I think it's figuring out what audience do you resonate with? What is your message? How is it adding value to that um, audience? And then, and then being able to just talk to people, you know? Um, on the DEI yeah. side, I think... And that, I think, again, that's another market that a lot of people are stepping into. Uh, in my opinion, some folks that probably shouldn't all be stepping into it, but a lot of people are stepping are stepping <laughs> into it. So I feel like everyone's just like, I can do this. I'm like, they can do the work. They, 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 they see it as a cash cow. So they, they're like, oh, I'm just... Yeah. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so again, in terms of, I'm sure if you have any thoughts on this too, especially on the DEI stuff, I think like... <laughs> I would just say proceed with caution. If, if you've gone to like one workshop or read two books... It might not be something you want to like, because 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 the thing is, this work can be so transformative. And my heart for it is like we need people. And I'm not saying you have to be perfect, but that are excellent and have committed time and energy to really thinking deeply about the space that you want to be in. And don't try and be the jack of all trades. You know, if your thing is bias, stick to bias. If your thing is like courageous conversations across difference, stick to that. But I've seen some folks where because. DEI is still this large blanket. Some folks are just like, I could do everything. I could talk about bias. I could talk about, I could talk about, I, I don't know, there's like 50 million things. And then you see some of their presentations and you're just like, yeah, you probably read one page of one book on this specific topic. And that's, so I, I just think there's there's a requirement of brilliance in, in, in some of these things. It's not that people need to be perfect, but be committed to it. Put yourself in a community where you're constantly thinking about mm -hmm. it. Um, but there is a lot of opportunity there. So I would say, but figure out what your lane is, start specific. And then as you grow as a professional or as you grow in your space and continue to, to grow from there. But, but the last thing I'll say yeah. is in caution is also like, don't, don't expand prematurely, i.e. If, if you're not ready, because you might speak in a space and say something incorrectly, or might if there is a space, an area of ignorance, and, and you might say something, that can really hurt your business as, as well. And especially in the DEI space, yeah. um, where there's very critical, cautious, frustrated people, you want to really handle with care and make sure you're very intentional and well thought out in, in what you're saying and presenting. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I feel like me and you had the same business model. Um, I think before I even started uh, getting paid to public speak, I was I was doing it for free for almost a year and a half uh, at every venue. Like, cause uh, well, it was a mental thing too. I didn't think I was good enough to be charging people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Until, until somebody forced some money on me, like, hey, uh, we 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 need the. Uh, have a speaker come for this thing, how much you charge? It's like, oh, I don't know. Uh, it's like, well, how much you charge such as a diet? Like, you need to charge. You're pretty good. Like, I don't know why you're not charging. It's like, yeah. all right, how much you want to charge for this month, right? And I was like, all right. Uh, I gave him a number. And he's like, wait, that's it? I was like, dang, you pay more? He's like, yeah, like, we got a budget for it. Like, yeah. how, much, yeah. how much you want? <laughs> I hear that. And I was like, I didn't know it was like that. <laughs> yeah. 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 I had to come up with that game plan. So I, it was forced upon me. Um, what do you think the future has in store, you know, respectfully for our industries? When we, when we look at D&I, when you look at consulting, when you look at the education space, especially for people of color, what, what does the future have in store? What do you see? Yeah, I, I think a few things. I think on education, there's um, there's a thing about DEI that's really going to change. I think we're really looking at changing standardized testing and what that looks like. I think we're reexamining the role of suspension and expulsion of students and looking at more restorative ways of handling it. Um, on DEI, I mean, I think it's really a growing industry, I think. But I, I, I do think... Um, Companies in the next probably five or 10 years, I think are going to have a better understanding of what they're really looking for and having more clear benchmarks. And I think uh, right now, I feel like it's almost like if anyone's ever worked with a black person, we have a DEI role for you. Or if you've ever done this type of thing, we have a DEI role for you in some spaces. And I think companies are getting a more clear grasp on what it means to be held to a, a accountability and values driven companies. Um, 
Mm-hmm. And so those are just a few things that I'm thinking of, uh, top of top of mind, top of mind. Man, I love it. I think that's a, a great thing, uh, um, which hopefully presents opportunities um, for more individuals that look like us and and an a, 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 a expanded shared humanity. All right. Well, yeah. you know me. You could talk probably talk forever, but um, yes, I try to keep this in what you be a drive time, uh, depending on what people do nowadays. Yeah, so right. uh, let's end it off like this: What are what what projects are you currently working on, and where can people find you? Yes, so they can find me on my website jordanjharrison.com and my Instagram jordanjharrison. Current projects. Uh, consulting a lot for companies and help them think through DEI strategies, uh, particularly a few international companies on just like what does international DEI scope of work look like. Still work with my boy Austin Martin with Rhymes with Reason. So we are making education accessible through um, hip hop music for young folks and thinking about that. And I think the last project, I think those are the main two that I'll speak about today. But outside of that, still speaking, but you can see me at jordanjharrison.com. Nice, nice. And then I'm going to get all his links and every everything that he just mentioned and anything else he wants to mention in the future. I'm going to put them in the show notes so that you guys can access Mr. George Rome Harrison. Yes. Uh, any last words for the people before we head out? That's it. Basic conditions, changing conclusions, and let's make some deep impact every single day. Appreciate you, Terrell. All right. <laughs> no worries, brother. I always make a deep impact no matter where you go. Yes, That's sir. it for this episode of Rise Urban Nation. Cool, cool.